going on in the world. It's very, very upsetting. So, oh yeah, just I know. really crazy, awful. Got it. I know, and we we I don't know how it's going to shift. We've got to figure out how this world is going to caring about each other versus bombing each other. Shift. We've got to figure out how this world is going to caring about each other versus bombing each other. Shift. We've got to this world is going to. Sorry, I always happens. I always do that. I leave uh, the Facebook tabs open in my browser, and you can just hear. You can hear ourselves. All right, it should be all set now. Well, thanks for coming on tonight. We oh, appreciate it. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, no, it's um, yeah. We were just talking about you know this. I wonder if Putin has a dog or animal that that he's nurtured, or is he just? I don't know anything about his 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 background as a human being in relationship to you know other beings besides you know what he's how he he you know he's he leads the country so. Does anybody know if he has his pets? I, I, never I, I, I heard there was one woman who studied him for a few years and uh -huh. had a documentary or something about him, but that's all I really know. But he definitely could use a new microbiome. Mm. <laughs> I'm not, not yeah. Sure. I mean, we can give him Hana's microbiome, he'll be so happy and sweet and want to love everybody, kiss <laughs> everybody, oh. you know. So but so anyway, did you have any specific topic you want to talk about or you want me to talk about some cases that I've had this past week? And I, I, you know, always, love, I always love to hear the cases. Um, I find that stuff really interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a bunch of topics that people, you know, asked us to cover. Um, okay. We could just kind of fly through those or we could okay. select a couple and, you know, save some for another time. Why don't we, why don't we start with, um, with some of the case studies? I would love to hear. Yeah, no, I've had a really interesting case, um, and we're still in the midst of it, but it, it's been like blowing my mind, which is sort of really cool. I love that. I love to get a case and see things happen that you think could happen, but they seem almost impossible, and then they happen, and then you're going, oh, what was that, right? So this is a Rottweiler who is about 16 months old, 15 months old, and a little over two and a half months ago, uh, he got hit by a car and got a very bad fracture of his back and had back and they had three doctors told her to euthanize the dog at Tufts and that he may never gain back his bladder to control or his, you know, colon control. And, you know, so, but she, she, she loves her dog and she wasn't going to give up on him. And so she's had the surgery and he is, he's, he, he's walking and he walks sort of with a, like a, a drag and a step down and drag and a step down, but he's totally incontinent. She has to um, express his bladder. She used to have to catheterize him all the time. Now she's, she was pushing, she has to push the bladder out several times a day. And, and she's a, she's a nursing student. So she learns, learned how to do this on her, you know, with, with guidance. And, <clears throat> and then he had soft sort of putting stools since the accident and so he's basically his anus was all ulcerated on the top and his stools were just running out of him like splattering all over his back end and he was in a diaper and in uh, a full diaper and then another one over his his uh, penis like two diapers one for the tush you know for the stool and one in the bladder and she's been taking you know wonderful care of him and so he came in a week ago tuesday so it'll be two weeks on tuesday <clears throat> this coming Tuesday. So he came in a week and a half ago. And, um, you know, I said, well, you know, we, he's been on, he's, he'd been on multiple different antibiotics for the bladder, but they, they cultured out uh, two species, uh, one, or at least one species that they found it was uh, sensitive to only chlorophenicol. So chlorophenicol is an antibiotic that was taken off the market 25, 30 years ago, because it causes severe blood dysgrasias, kidney issues, liver issues. And so, you know, when you see that come up, it's like, oh my God, what do I have left to use? Because it's an antibiotic that was used a lot in veterinary medicine, a lot in rabbits and stuff like that um, 35 years ago. And, and then they found that it caused all these really serious medical issues. So it's been taken off the market. So you have to like get it specially compounded and stuff like that to get it for your dog. So this dog's been on that antibiotic for quite a while, still having very stinky putrefied urine and this diarrhea all the time. <clears throat> so I said, let's just stop the, she came, I talked to her Monday before the Tuesday appointment, stop your antibiotic. 
I, it seems it's not working anyway, because the still it's been on it for a while and it's not even working. So I said, let's, let's just flush the bladder. We'll flush the bladder with ozone. We'll do our hemolumin with, um, you know, high dosage of vitamin C and all the stuff that we support bladder infections with. And we did that on Tuesday. We did that on Thursday. And I didn't want to give him a fecal transplant because he had been on chlorophenicol and I didn't want to kill the new microbes coming in with this really, really strong antibiotic orally, right? So we did the first, and when I did his, I did aqua, I did, did ozone over his pelvis and then I put aquapuncture. So I put needles down and put the B12 injections. And I, you know, when I put the needles into a pelvis, it just sort of slides into these muscles. It literally felt like I was going through beef jerky instead of going through a piece of steak that, you know, having to push my needle, like it, to work it through that intense kind of, it almost had become dried out muscle from the surgery, from the, the, the non-ability for it to heal because it was on so many antibiotics and drugs. <clears throat> so I kept, I, I put the needle and it was like, oh, what? Oh my God, this is terrible. So anyway, long story short, we did that Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and actually I think it was Friday night of that week, the dog started to wag its tail. It hadn't been able to, it didn't move its tail for three months or two and a half months. So it started to wag its tail. We gave it a fecal transplant and the dog's stools became normal and he was just sort of pushing them out, not knowingly pushing them out, which was better than all this, this buttering blobby stuff he was coming out with. And then she called me on Friday night, this past Friday, he urinated on his own and pooped on his own. Wow. Now that's a miracle. I, I, you know, when I looked through the medical records, they said he may never get his bladder tone back to have that happen in one week is a miracle. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. And I think if, you know, what I want to say to the people out there is that it is the combination of allowing the microbiome which has the communication skills um, to talk to the bladder. You're talking about the, the, you know, the parasympathetic nerves that are serviced by the vagus nerve, which the vagus nerve communicates from the gut to the brain, back to the gut, back to the organs. And if you don't have that communication, you can't have healing happen. So by stopping the antibiotics, by putting this dog on healthy microbiome, I think that this has been such a positive for this dog. You know, we're still not out of the out of the dark with that bladder infection. You know, we're going to do more cultures on it, but it's it's a lot better than it was. I mean, a lot better, right? So my hope is that by having a bladder that was had its tone back, we can give it lots of fluids, and she's not having to press on that bladder and press on the bladder, and the dog can actually urinate out and empty that bladder. I, I'm hoping we can get rid of the urinary tract infection, but as it stagnated in that bladder, because there was no bladder tone. So I want to relate this story to um, a story that I've told before, and it's on my website and other people can share it on my resources on my website, was a story about uh, my sister's boyfriend's mother, whose name is Doris. And about eight years ago, they started going out and uh, she was telling me about his mother who had, um, uh, had was demented was in a wheelchair, had, had Parkinson's, demented, in a wheelchair, couldn't take her Parkinson's medication because she had C. diff, Clostridium difficile. <clears throat> so she couldn't walk anymore. And so she couldn't stand up on her own. She had been in a diaper and with antibiotics for about, for her bladder for several years now because she, she couldn't hold her urine at all. And uh, so this was a woman who was ready for a nursing home. And they, you know, the family was trying to figure out what to do. And I said, you know, why don't you get in touch with a doctor and get her a fecal transplant? She's got C. diff, which is the only way in the United States you can legally get a fecal transplant. So they looked at that and they said, that's disgusting. She's not, this is eight years ago. They're not going to get her a fecal transplant. That's not something she'll do. And a year goes by and she's more demented. She can't walk. She's, they're read, they said, well, she needs assisted living completely. She can't be on her own. She can't think, she can't do anything. So there, I, I, then again, I raised my hand and go, get her a fecal transplant. So they looked into it. Medicare won't give you a fecal transplant till you have three separate hospitalizations for C. diff, right? Mm -hmm. She only had two. 
So she did what, promised her kids or told her kids, I will never go in the hospital again to get another fetal transplant. So she, she said, I'm not going, I'm not, you know, I don't want to go into the hospital again and get treated just so I can get treated with a fetal transplant. So I said, pay out of pocket, just talk, tell, find out a doctor and go to a doctor and pay out of pocket. She found that Cedar sinai I think was $12,000. Mayo Clinic was $6,000 and Scripps Institute was $750. She went to Scripps Institute because they live in Arizona. She went to Scripps Institute in California. Five minutes it took, five minutes. They put a nasal gastric tube down, injected a slurry like I do with a rectal, but a slurry through the nasal gastric tube. I spoke to her five days later and she said, I actually can think a thought through my brain. I haven't been able to even talk on the phone. She said, I can actually think and, and I can take my Parkinson's medication because my gut feels so much better. I can actually move my, do, be abnormal, normal gut motility. So five weeks later, my sister and her boyfriend, they can't find her because she's at the mall with her friends, has all her brain capacity, 100% and all her bladder tone back, no wow. inhibition. So mm-hmm. here is a case where it is clearly the microbiome that did it, right? And to have somebody's brain capacity come back 100%. I mean, five months later, my sister actually got to see her because she had never seen her in the situation that she was clearing up. She saw her as a demented woman who was in a walker who you know needed assistance as somebody who was like 50 years old, whose brain capacity was back 100%. And they couldn't believe it. They could, nobody can believe it, that it's the same person. So mm-hmm. something is, as, as, you know, as what we consider sort of crap, you know, that we're doing something so amazing and we can't do it because you have to have three episodes of hospitalizations to get to it. You know, so think of all the people that are suffering that would so benefit by getting a more diverse microbiome. Same thing with the animals. So I was hoping that maybe I would just control the diarrhea. I thought if I got bladder tone back, that will be a miracle. And I just think it's a miracle. You know, I mean, I did acupuncture and aquapuncture and I did points to help with the tail and I did points to help with the bladder, but still to have that communication happen again, to me, was amazing. Amazing. I can't hear you. So (laughs) sorry, that's pretty incredible story. And, uh, I love hearing stuff like that. Diana D said, wow, that's amazing. I wish I knew about FMT for my cat that passed, but I also feel like he sent me my current dog who has led me down this rabbit hole. I'm more broke than ever, but learning so much and very grateful to her. I agree. You know, um, treating your animals, uh, you know, the way, like the right way that we should all be treating ourselves too, it gets very expensive. You know, I wish insurances would cover more than what they do. Yeah. And I think we all need to demand that from the insurance companies. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm very disappointed in Trupanion because they said they would cover a lot of this stuff and then they don't, um, you know, but I just feel like they, they need to hear from consumers that, you know, we want to get insurance and we want you to cover things that are a lot less expensive. This woman doesn't have insurance, but they would cover that whole pelvic surgery and all that you know, $15,000 or whatever it would have been. I don't even know. It's probably around that now. Um, Mm. But to try to get this dog so it it would not, um, to get balance back out again, they cover the fecal transplant. They don't cover the ozone. And I think you need the ozone, you know? And so I've been complaining to them for now, like over three years because they were covering ozone and then they, they withdrew it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That's like one of the most least expensive tools we can use. I have healthy paws. A healthy paws when I, you know, and I used it for Allie. She was going there, you know, every week at the end of her life, you know, getting everything right. Aquapuncture. They were they covered they covered fecal transplant. They covered the ultraviolet blood therapy, the o, IV ozone. Um, and they, you know, they that, covered. That's great. And that's that's which one again? Which company do you have? That was, that was healthy paws. Healthy paws. So you know, yeah. I've been because I, I think Pet Plan does carry do ozone. And they, so got, and I know some of the other ones say it's experimental. Well, and they you know. and they covered her. Uh, they covered her um, chiropractic and her physical therapy as well, which was great. Not that, I didn't, not that I didn't have to, you know, kind of get on the phone and have these long conversations, stay on hold for a while. Like it was very challenging to advocate to get them to cover some things. But 
you know, it ultimately happened and it was very helpful. So mm-hmm. that's why when I got Tucker the day before Thanksgiving, the very next day I signed him up for uh, insurance. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, whether or not I'm going to use it is like I did with Allie. It'll be good to have. Um, we got a couple questions uh, before we go into the uh, other um, case study. Did you said you have another one too? Uh, well, that one's the main one. I mean, there's some others too that are that are just truly amazing too. That are you know dogs that have been on Apoquil for two years, and then we do what we do, and they get their hair back and they they start yeah. healing. You know, and I think it's a combination of the oxidative therapies and the and the yeah. fetal transplant. It's amazing. I definitely want to hear about that. So uh, one of the commenters, uh, J- Jenna Janney, she wants to know a bit about ratio of fruit and veggies to meat you know and i said to her you know do you mean in dr roman's plant-based recipe and she said i don't know but she mixes fruits veggies and meat together and just would be wondering what would be the best ratio you know she gives her uh dog gracie a lot of a lot of produce pureed with some meat and she's wondering what you do that's what i do (laughs) so i mean my i have my recipe i have uh, like one of the older versions of my recipe but my, what I'm using for animal protein for my fifth generation, the sixth generation is still, they're not yet six months. So I'm giving them a larger percentage of uh, animal protein with their raw um, egg and, uh, a, you know, two tablespoons of Scottish cottage cheese. This is for, you know, for three of them now and uh, some raw goat milk. And, but I usually, you know, I'll make up my vegetable mixture, which is uh, beets, carrots, kale, bok choy, uh, string beans, um, uh, ca- let's see, uh, bok choy, some shard. Um, and then, um, oh gosh, I have, a, I, I, I use like about eight different, nine different vegetables and I puree them all in the Cuisinart. And then I cook butternut squash mostly and a little bit of sweet potato. And I make a, a you know, an orange mush together and that's in a pot. The vegetables are in a pot and then the fruits are like berries, apples, lots of blueberries. Um, and then uh, a few bananas, kiwi, um, a, a papaya and pineapple um, because of that stuff, because of the papain and the bromelain for digestive enzymes. Um, and what else do I put in there? I think that's it. Pretty apples, pears. And then I puree all that. And that's in a big, it's like a big smoothie. And I take a scoop of the smoothie and I take a scoop of the vegetable smoothie and I take a scoop of the squash and sweet potato smoothie. And then I put in like two, um, uh, two cups of quinoa um, and puree that together. So it's, I would say if you're using two cups of quinoa and the rest is, is veggies. And so equal parts of the fruit and the equal parts of the sweet potato and the, and the, um, the butternut squash, and then equal parts of that. So one third, like one quarter of each part of that is, is the, um, and a little bit more of the, the two cups of the grain going in there. And then for the meat portion, for these adult dogs, the meat portion is about a cup of cut up venison or cut up um, tripe that goes into a big bowl that feeds them. So that's eight meals for two dogs. So they're getting one eighth of a cup per meal of meat. Wow. So a very low percentage. So it's about 8% um, meat that they get. And the rest is all vegetables. The puppies get that same amount of meat, but they also get like a half a cup of, or cup of other raw goat milk, a cup, two eggs, and like a third of a container of cottage cheese. So they're getting that in, in, the, in it. But I do add nutraceuticals to the mixture of my stuff. So I'm adding, you know, new pro, which is the, you know, kelp, I'm, I'm adding um, uh, Carlson's fish oil, which is a high quality. So that has some animal protein in it or animal parts to it. Um, and the rest of it is, is you know, nutritional yeast that comes from Compassion Circle. Um, and then uh, taurine, uh, um, liquid aminos, uh, the Bragg's to give it some flavoring. And um, I'm missing, what else am I missing? So the taurine, oh, and then digestive enzymes, because I'm adding, even though I'm doing fresh ones, I add more in because I want them to break it down. Well, let me just see if this is, 
uh, miss my sister, but I'll call her back. <laughs> anyway. yeah, you, okay, so in your recipe, your your plant based adult recipe and your plant based poppy poppy recipe are mm -hmm. on the Mitch website too. So, Jen, uh, Jenny, if you want me to link you to those, I can. If you can't find them, I can maybe post them in the in the comments. Um, but that's great. I, that sounds great. Michelle has a, a, a live question. She says, if you're in now, Michelle uh, runs Monkey's House Senior Dog Hospice in New Jersey, oh, nice. and she does everything holistically with all these dogs. She Hold goes, on one second. Let me just let me just tell my sister. I'll call her back. Hold on. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, no worries. Uh, Michelle says, if urine is green and has sediment, but UA, I'm thinking that's urinary, urinary analysis. If urine is green and has sediment, but UA is clean and CS grows, nothing. Knows nothing. In, in, okay. in, uh, grow, shows nothing and was reviewed by internist. How long should I wait to send more urine? The dog is healthy but he's paralyzed and has a bladder stone wedged in the top of his urethra. We're in a bit, a bit of a pickle here. Okay. So because a culture is negative, doesn't give you a lot of information. Okay. Because the cultures can only tell about 12 species. In a normal body, there are 500 species and a thousand subspecies. We don't even know what's in the bladder. Okay. We don't know. So when I get a culture that comes back, there's nothing growing there. I'm like, are they kidding me? It's the same thing. If you do a swab, you're, you know, swab somewhere and they come up with nothing growing. If you could only grow 12 species, then what are you growing? Like what, what you can't grow the other ones. You wouldn't even know how to take care of them to grow them. So there's a lot that is as um, preliminary as everything is, you know, or, or juvenile or, or, you know, we haven't gotten to the science where we can actually look at something and look at the 500 species that could be sitting there. We can look at 12 of them and that's not enough. And so, you know, when you have a, an interstitial cystitis where cultures don't show anything, it could be viral, it could be mycoplasm, it could be bacteriophage, it could be an array of different types of viral particles that could be causing this inflammation of the dog's bladder, but no culture is gonna tell you that. You know, the, my dog culture, which is supposed to be more of DNA and some RNA, you can tell 100 species, but there are 500 species that are there. So they are way ahead of any Antec or IDEX or any of the companies that we use that do urine cultures because they are at least looking at DNA. They're not looking at just the what grows. They're looking at what the DNA is. But we even did. that is, is weak. We did that. We did the my dog, M-I-D-O-G. Michelle, in case you're interested, I don't know if a veterinarian has to have it or if a pet parent can order it, but we did that for Allie and it was some kind of like mycoplasm, I think. And, you know, we did the ozone in the bladder uh, with, through the, you know, like taking the cysto, but injecting ozone and I videoed it and all that. And, you know, I don't know if every dog can tolerate that. Allie was, you know, oftentimes would have some, some cannabis before she'd get that and she she's so toler tolerated whatever you, we do to her but i felt like the bladder ozone was a game changer for her because of her chronic you know bladder and urinary infections um throughout her life cuz i don't know if it was her spine that was not communicating with the, the disc issue if she could, she already had incontinence due to plechner but the bladder ozone was was great and and michelle was only a couple hours i know it's a lot but a couple hours from Dr. Bukoff now, who's got your- Bukoff, yeah. So Dr. Bukoff, um, Jerry Bukoff, who's in uh, Little Falls, New Jersey, just got one of my puppies. So he has cilantro. Does he um, do ozone? Yeah. He does? Ozone, he's going to be building a brand new clinic that is going to have a whole room dedicated to microbiome. Oh, good. Right. Oh, he's paralyzed. Right. You know, he's, he's so paralyzed. A paralyzed dog to get the microbiome done would be great to have this dog get a fecal transplant. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've been pretty bold. Um, uh, you know, I, um, I, I've been pretty bold about just giving poop to everything and just seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really exciting to see the things change because we know, we know so little about the microbes and how they communicate throughout the rest of the body 
So, you know, if these animals, you know, we could say it's placebo effect. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think that's placebo effect in a week to get urinary continence and stool continence in a week. I mean, I don't think that's just going to happen anyway, but that may be what, you know, the university would say, oh, it was going to happen right now at this point anyway, right? So I, you hope that they will hear these things and go, let's share ideas, guys. You know, people love their animals. We love our, you know, our, their, our family. And if there's something that we can make their life easier, you know, we can, we should be able to try it, you know, and not have it looked upon as that sounds wrong. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And, uh, so we got a couple questions too in in the um, in the post I made a few days ago, asking for some topics. We had we had two people, uh, Joe and Christy. They wanted Christy and Joe. They wanted us to and you to talk about you know. Um, well, this question like it's, it's it's phrased you know why do veterinar why veteran why do veterinarians not help change the vaccine law? I think they are. I think many of them are trying to change the vaccine law. Um, some of us just don't have access to, you know, veterinarians like you, which is very unfortunate that advocate. Um, well, because you, well, the reason why is the state veterinarian has the laws set down to them by the USDA and the USDA and are you, the people that are in my state are the state veterinarians. If you talk about flexibility, there's nothing flexible. It's this. And you can talk to them blue in the face, give them the research, give them the data, I'm not doing anything because the USDA says I do this. Well, can you look at this information and look at this data? No, not doing it. Unless it comes from Washington, I'm not even going to read what you give me. And that's the attitude. And I find that very sad that these are veterinarians that should be still, ed they're doctors. They're supposed to be educators. They're supposed to be learning. And to, when you're in that position, you should be an advocate for learning more so that you can help more animals. But it's not like that. They get the rules and the regs and they just sit there and just blurp, you know, this is what we do. And, you know, you try to mention to them, why do you need a vaccine if you have antibodies? Why do you need a vaccine? You shouldn't have to have a vaccine. Well, this is the way it is. Why do you need to have a vaccine? You don't get that for yourself. Why would you get it for your animal? You not get it for your animal. So it's, it's trying to get them to change. And the, the, I completely understand their resistance because rabies is a transmissible disease that is fatal. And so if you have a disease that you consider to be so dangerous that it will kill you immediately, well, we, how many people died from you know, coronavirus that we could have maybe helped you know, with just some of these other therapies? But it, it, you can't talk about it with them. They won't, it doesn't, it's like, it's, it's this or, and you can't talk about any other way. So mm -hmm. until everybody starts to, get in touch with their congressmen and their senators and do it, the legislation that Arizona, Arizona's fell through. They didn't, they weren't able to do it. Um, and so you just, you, it's political, you know, it's a, it's nobody wants to touch it. The, 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 the state says in the, in the USDA says, you can't do that. You're going to have rabies running through the United States and people are going to be dying from rabies. And, and, and it would happen if we weren't finding out if these animals didn't have antibodies, if we found that they had antibodies and they were protected, then we should protect them from having to get another vaccine if they have antibodies. No, I just, I, uh, I emailed Jean Dodd's, you know, Shadow's situation. And mm -hmm. she told me, she told me that, cause you know, Jean helped me years ago with, uh, with Allie when she had gut trauma, before I met you, she's mm -hmm. always very, very helpful with her time. She said to me that, um, cause I told her, you know, 0 0.5 uh, is the legal minimum, but she said, that's the who, international standard exactly. Exactly. But the, the u.s standard is at or above 0 0.1 right so 0 0.1 is the minimum the minimum there but what i've tried to do with all of my cases because 0 0.1 is the far edge of the whole thing so someone say well what if your dog next week has zero mm -hmm. you know what if you don't have you know to have them drop from five to zero doesn't happen I've never seen it happen in all the career, but if it's right at that edge and it gets attacked by a wild animal, you know, I can see where the board would say, or the, the, the state would say, would you, did you, you don't, you have it right this minute. Do you have it know what it is now. I mean, it was six months ago. It was 0.1. What is it right now? Yeah, right. So that's why I'm trying to stay within that 
quote unquote, the World Health Organization's legal thing, because it makes it, it you know, if I have an animal that has cancer and autoimmune disease or is ill, really ill, then, then giving them an exemption and knowing that the dog has 0.1, we still have something there. So if it did get bitten by something rabid, we could give it a booster it, right now, because the law has changed that we can give them a booster if they've had a rabies vaccine in prior and put them into to four months quarantine or five months quarantine. What would you, what, what are the, like, we know cancer, but autoimmune is like a spectrum, right? Like, can that be like, obviously Plaquenil falls under that, but what else would be autoimmune? Like pretty you much, know. you know, things that attack your own body. So, you know, is, is diabetes autoimmune? Yeah. It's your, 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 your insulin, your islet cells of your, your pancreas aren't, are shutting down. They're not producing it. So it's, it's an, it's the self thing that happens, you know, cancer, you know, uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, um, you know, allergies are autoimmune. The immune system doesn't know how to identify, you know, grass as being something that you live with. Right. Right. Or you can't eat, you know, it's just this, your body doesn't understand how to direct your immune system to, to stay healthy, you know, so it just keeps attacking everything that walks through the door. Yeah. So, you know, so, but you know, that's why I know with, we're trying to figure out what to do with your dog. And I, as much as I want to give everybody exemption, I am trying to do it so that I can consistently go to, if the board crushes me again, because I didn't vaccinate a dog that I had vaccinated it and it was in a three-year status and it had cancer, bad cancer, and it had Lyme, anaplasma, and hypothyroid. And its, it's uh, antibody level was five, was five, where it needs 0.5. So it was 10 times more than it needed to be. And the, um, uh, the, that next year when it came in, it was really sick and the cancers had, had spread and it was, and so we, we didn't get take a titer on it. So the titer was a year and one month uh, when the dog bit somebody and the veterinary, veterinary board's been trying to take my license over it, that I didn't vaccinate that dog. And I have stood up to them, you know, costing me hundreds of thousands of dollars to be able to say, you wanted me to give this dog a vaccine when it was so sick and it still had antibodies, uh, you know, a year before and had five times, you know, and, and it's like, I don't see any, any, um, anything that's written in the licensing of that vaccine, if it says only can be given to a healthy animal. And that dog was not healthy to give a vaccine to, but the board is still trying to take my license over it. Yeah. You know, they, it's, they, it's they, have it out, they have it out for you for sure. That's for sure. Well, that They do, they do. Because they know I'm, I just stand up, you know, and say, well, why not? Well, exactly. Go to give a rabies vaccine. Well, you know, the, the person entered the house without permission from the dogs, just entered the house with nobody home and scared the other dog and the dog bit it. And so I'm to blame for that because I mean, I'm not to blame for that, you know? And, uh, so anyway. So uh, no, that was, a, that was an awesome answer. I appreciate that. Diana, cause we had several people uh, and as well as myself still confused about a couple areas with, with the, with that. So that was very, uh, thanks for clarifying. Diana wants to know, she says, I'm wondering about hyperkeratosis and how to help my dog. Funny thing is it went away after the fecal transplant with Dr. Roman's Hannah's poop. Now, months later, it's back. Of course, she needs another fecal transplant. I can't afford it right now. And she's on a door beast, uh, you know, alternating the leaky gut and the yeast protocols um, mm -hmm. and hoping to continue to further heal the gut. Just wondering what's causing this hyperkeratosis and how to help her more. You know, um, well, I think you need more poop. You know, your dog is probably missing a lot of the connections between the microbes, which we don't know yet. So we don't know what species your dog has. You can do the 16S, but that's 16 species. There are 500 species and a thousand subspecies. And we may find out that species number 275 and number 401, they have to be present for your dog to metabolize whatever it is that keeps your skin from getting into problems and starting the hyperkeratosis and all that. So, yeah. you know, is the thyroid, you know, weak and with the gut flora restore the, flo the thyroid. And that's some of the things that I see is dogs that we screen and their thyroids are low. We would call them euthyroid or low thyroid animals. We give them the fecal transplant and it becomes normal. And so that is a correction of the endocrine system through the gut. And, you know, my dogs are intact females and I don't know where your dog is and is it intact. And it's not getting 
the normal stimulation of the gut communication skills that happen because those hormones are critical for the health of the animal mm -hmm. and they're not getting it. So that's why I think a lot that our microbiome works so well is because we have intact females that are, 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 and then in the, like in, in the New Jersey, uh, little cilantro is an intact male, but he's not, he's only five, six months old. So he hasn't really achieved his, um, you know, sexual, you know, he'll like another two months and he'll be having all of his hormones. Diane also had a question about, um, you know, both her dogs seem to be having high protein in their urine and she's not really sure why this is happening or how to help them. She just got the results and, you know, of course she's going to so be- If they're eating a high protein, you know, uh, meat-based diet, they may have that in the, in the high protein in the urine. Okay. That could be something that could just tweak it. They could have slightly and then it's a little higher because of that. Okay. Gotcha. Um, and now we had a couple people ask about- um, maybe you can clarify because I'm not sure if I understand hormone balancing for intact dogs and what causes imbalances and what can we do to prevent or control it? You know, intact so, dog hormone can, you know, does that mean like uh, trying to reduce, reduce the amount of food that like Plechner maybe says so to if you have, if you have dogs, uh, so I don't understand. Cause if they're, if the dog is intact, then it should have the hormones. I mean, if it's, an intact male and it has like a Sertoli cell tumor so on the testicle, it would produce a lot of estrogens, but yeah. normal dogs with their normal testicular uh, hormones or females, they, they should be fairly balanced unless they have some kind of uh, cystic ovary or, you know, something that's causing them to have an imbalance of what their body's supposed to be going through. So I, I, I would, I don't I think would, I have a question yeah. for them, however. I know I, I would say my mind goes to like what I learned from Dr. Becker when I made all these changes for Allie in terms mm -hmm. of making sure that her pet bed was organic and there's no flame retardants used on it. Oh, you know, absolutely. That I, is really important. I mean, I I can't go as far as get organic rugs and I mean you could, but you know, furniture, you know, comforters, everything, you know, because it can get quite costly. So, you know, when she was on her on her on the couch and she likes to lick the couch, I'd put an organic cotton towel mm -hmm. over. And that way she could lick that and, and be safer. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd have an air purifier going, you know, because I think those things can, can, uh, I'm not, I'm still a little bit confused on the estrogen stuff. Like some can be toxic, some can be good, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, reducing the amount of chemical exposure in your environment can also be very helpful. Um, you can go down that rabbit hole. That, that, that's a big, that's a big. Oh topic. yeah. I mean, there are 90,000 chemicals that are in the environment that weren't there a hundred years ago. Yeah. So how many of those have phytoestrogens in them that come from petroleum and from, you know, and so many of them that we use, you know, we all use plastic, you know, we all, it's just, it's, it's everywhere, mm -hmm. you know, so how much is accumulating in their body fat and causing that to happen? It's, it is, it's a, we live in a toxic world and it's getting, you know, more toxic because more, more people want more electronics and plastic. And, you know, we just live in this very, you know, exposed and I, I live in it too. I, I live, you know, I don't, you know, my house is organic as I can be, but it, we still, I still have to put, you know, stuff in plastic. You know, I still use, pla I use as much glass as I can and stainless steel, but I still have to use plastic too. Do you use, uh, do you, do you feed your dogs or take yourself any chlorella? Um, I used to, well, it, the, the, I don't know. I'm not taking, I used to take chlorella like years ago, years ago. And I use it, the spirulina in our mash mix, which is very similar. Yes. And I've been using that for like 35 years to help clean the body. But personally, I, I should take chlorella. Um, but the um, they're getting the the kelp, you know, from that's from the new pro that I put in there. So they're getting a lot of um, you know ocean kelp, not the chlorella from the lakes and oh, stuff like that. That's wonderful. Um, Penny says. Uh, herbs and homeopathics for, okay, for common ailments, that would be, you know, maybe, maybe you can talk about your uh, homeopathic go home kit you, you give to new clients. Okay. Well, I, I've been, you know, I've studied homeopathy since 1993 and studied with Luke DeShepper, studied with um, Paul Hershkew, studied with uh, Richard Pitcarn for years, but, you know, and so I've been trained as a human homeopath. And then I took the veterinary stuff because I, I wanted, I figured if I could learn it in humans, I could treat my kids and I could take care of my family. And so by learning it in humans, then you go and do the veterinary and then 
you know, it's, they're very similar, but the human one is much, much, much more detailed in the mind and the mental. So there's a lot of components with that that fit in versus some of the, the, the symptoms that you see, because you can't always interpret what the dog is feeling mentally. You know, you, you try to interpret that. So there's a lot of more learning that has to go in with human homeopathy. Um, so in my homeopathic kit, what I was trying to do is I'd love everybody to have 20 remedies. And I was like, wanted, and I figured I can't get people to spend money on 20 remedies. Let's, what are the six remedies that if I got stuck on a, a desert island, what would, I, what would I have on my, on myself? And one would be Arnica, which is for pain and inflammation. And it can also be for, you know, feeling sick and just feeling achy all over the place, but it's really for pain and, and inflammation. Two is apis, which is for bee stings and insect stings. So for swelling and for, you know, getting edema and swelling in your, in your body. Then we have letum, which is for punctures and being hit in the eye. And letum is also good for tick bites. So it's, it's a good thing for any kind of puncture and tick bite. We have arsenicum, which is very good for diarrhea. It's good for flu symptoms, you know, mm -hmm. for achiness and flu and uh, anxiety. Um, so if you're really anxious about something or you're, you know, you feel like you're going to die from something you just ate and it's good for food poisoning. So I put the, the arnica, I mean, the arsenicum. Kalinda acts like a natural antibiotic. So having something that you can use for infection, uh, it also increases peristaltic movement. And I use it a lot for obstructions, uh, but Kalindala can be made, taken orally. You can put it, you know, you can use it as a wash for their for part of the body. You can even like with all homeopathic remedies, the best is putting it on the tongue. And the last one is uh, roost tox, which is for itchiness and stiffness and sort of, um, you know, where, where you're getting similar kind of symptoms of like poison ivy and stuff like that. So I, that's, there's a six, there's a six remedy kit that we have at my clinic that you can get it at Whole Foods. I'm not selling the, the, right, right. you know, to make money and we, you know, we could just, you can't get all the potencies that I like in you know, at Whole Foods. So it's getting, and we've been selling them for, I don't know, since, since 1993, I've been selling them. And so when I tell my clients to get one, they can get them themselves you know, they could go to Whole Foods and ask somebody, what do I take for a bee sting? And they'd say, take this. So are the, those people, you know, practicing medicine without a license for homeopathics, they can read it in a book and go down to the drugstore or the homeopathic, you know, uh, pharmacy or Whole Foods or some health food store and pick it up themselves. So it's just, um, it, it's, a, it's an issue when the veterinary board says I'm practicing human medicine because I tell people to use the kit, you mm -hmm. know. They can read their own. They they can buy their kit themselves. They don't have to have me tell you. Know, I ha like I told you. I remember walking in the woods with you. This was a couple of years ago, before, obviously before COVID, when we do we used to do hikes with Ellie and your dogs. And I, I was so scared to tell you that I hired a homeopath. But I, you know, to have somebody that could be on the phone with me for two hours and explain. Oh yeah, it's hard. You know, it's hard. Like, Chronic disease is very hard to manage. Yeah, but uh, hiring a homeopath has been phenomenal to have you know it's just so customized they know the dog they go through all the details with you you know you have a plan you can reach out to them for an emergency like it has been such a good investment and i'm going to be doing a consult for myself as well uh in the next few weeks i hope um i had a there's a question here uh penny also wanted to ask about um lab results and stuff like that and, you know and i and i'm gonna uh penny i'm gonna link you to a um a mini course that dr judy morgan uh just came out with called understanding lab values simplified and then there's another uh deeper dive version as well and uh because that's something i've been wanting for a while because dr bob goldstein uh had something i believe you mentioned margo and I, yeah so bob, bob goldstein uh and and marty together designed this bionutritional analysis that i used for i don't know 15 20 years and then right. then they're, they're not really doing that anymore um, but it was a very clever thing where it, it took your specific animal, did the analysis, and then gave you all the nutraceuticals it compounded for your dog. So instead of, you know, what I, what I do is I give you a bottle of this, a bottle of this, a bottle of this, a bottle of this, and this homeopathic and this, and they would basically uh, taper it, you know, not taper it, but, you know, build it for your dog specifically and your dog's weight. Um, and I, and, and, but it was pricey, it was pricey to do, and it was pricey to get all their stuff. 
but it, it was definitely easier than me giving one of this, one of this, one of this. But sometimes I would look at it and go, you know, I don't agree with what they think on there. I would like to add more of this and, and a little bit more of that. And, you know, and then I, they'd have theirs and they'd have two or three of mine, you know? Yeah. So, um, but there, I don't think, I don't know if there's anybody who's really still doing that in a big way. Um, you really tape tailoring it to um, like now with humans, you've got a lot of functional medicine doctors that are, you know, doing the genome, uh, you know, like the Genova gut biome and then biome and they're looking at your gut and they're looking at your all your you know c-reactive proteins and all, looking at that and trying to figure out what nutraceuticals you can do that would what match up with what your body needs and that might be another thing to do too is to get a functional medicine doctor to do the lab work on you and look at it and i did that multiple years ago, like i want to say like five six years ago with frank schallenberger out in nevada and they took you know, hundreds of tests on me and, you know, finding this and that and the other thing. And, and I, you need it again. I mean, I haven't done it again, uh, but it would be good to do that. Mm, that'd be great. Um, we got a live question from uh, Wendy Potterton. She wants to know, what would you suggest for a positive Lyme with number 64 and no clinical signs? Okay. So the C6 is not a, it's, it's, I, I wouldn't put any money on a C6. Okay. I think it's a, it's a parameter to look at. Um, I've had dogs that are 450 that do fine, you know, and then I've had dogs that are six, uh, 70 and they seem like they've got symptoms. So it's not an accurate test to judge what is going on in the animal. But what I do for my clients is my recommendation is that they come up positive for Lyme or anaplasma or Ehrlichia is I love the ozone and the ultraviolet love, the blood therapy with the, either the chimp or the um, hemolumin and give them two or three of those injections and follow up with some ozone. And it's all really good for them. So the standard is to put them on doxycycline. You know, if they have it, the, in, the, in the lab results for the C6, they say if they're over, over 30 and they have any symptoms of Lyme, then put them on antibiotics for two to four weeks. And if there's no symptom, your dog could be exposed to Lyme and still have these the C6 reaction but it doesn't have anything that you can go and to go ahead and put them on doxycycline, which kills the microbiome, which increases their chances of cancer is, I don't think is the right decision to do, you know, especially if there's no symptom at all. So doing the ozone, doing the UVBI, doing, you know, giving them healthy microbiome to get their immune system stronger is my go-to. And I, you know, again, I, I've been practicing, you know, for almost 45 years, and, you know, I don't want to disrupt that gut. It is so valuable for us to keep that as healthy as possible. And I think any of you that are listening, that you talk about that with your vet and saying, you know, when you, when you put me on doxycycline for Lyme, what else are you killing in my body? Like, what else are you destroying my microbiome? And there was a paper that was written. And if you, you know, the, the more time you've been on antibiotics, the higher incidence of cancer that you get. And the drug that they, they highlighted was doxycycline. So I don't want to get the dog cancer, especially if it doesn't have any, any symptoms. I want to build it up. I want to get it so its immune systems can identify uh, the Lyme. And there are herbs that we use. Uh, the, I use um, PetRx, LG support. And, yeah, Japanese knotweed and is one of them. And there's it, several that Dr. Bu, Buher has put in his combination. That's great. Shadow had uh, Ehrlichia and I mean, it came out positive, but he wasn't showing any signs just like, just like your, your dog. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been treating him with, you know, rectal ozone at home, you mm -hmm. know, periodically, not like not weekly, not biweekly, whenever he had a flare or, you know, whenever I had time to go over, Oh, it's been a month. I might go give him a rectal ozone. Yeah. Right. Or if I see that he's a little bit sluggish with it, just to boost, give him a boost. And so, his test and I did some olive leaf with him and his test came back recently it was negative. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it had anything to do with that, but um, I have a feeling. I, I think, you know, if you, it, the thing is, if you gave them antibiotics and it came up negative, then they would say it's the antibiotics that got rid of it. So it's like, you know, it's the same thing with, if you give a dog a distemper shot and they don't get distemper that year, then you prevented distemper. Right. Right but you actually have harmed the dog if you're doing it every year because they don't need it, right? 
So mm -hmm. if, you, if you put them on antibiotics and they don't really need an antibiotic, A, you're causing resistant strains, which the AVMA says is a no-no. And you need to know exactly what you're doing when you give antibiotics. So people that are doing that are doing it because they don't know what else to do. If they knew that they could use ozone, they could stimulate the immune system, they could do some herbs, they could do stuff that's not disrupting the whole uh, resistance to antibiotics. That's what they should choose and not just go put them on antibiotics because they don't know any other thing else to do. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Uh, Maureen has a question on, you know, she has got a couple good topics for the future, but uh, maybe we could talk about, you know, the causes of chronic uh, UTIs and urinary stones um, and how, how you might go about treating that. Did we talk about that in the beginning? Was that something you covered? Well, the, the cause of stones is, you know, there's probably an abnormal balance of bacteria and that change of the pH and the bacteria is precipitating that the minerals to come out. So how do you rebalance that, you know? And that's, you know, it, nutrition is a big thing. Um, what's her name? Um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting her name. Who does the, the diets um, that will, if your dog comes back and it has oxalate crystals or has, uh, you know, tri, triphosphates and stuff like that, um, they, she can design a diet that, oh God, I can't believe I'm forgetting your name. Design, to, to, you know, design a diet that will, uh, fill your, you know, give you the right measurements of everything and make sure that they're leaving out the things that would cause crystals to precipitate. And I cannot believe I'm forgetting your name. Is, oh, it, is, it, is it the person that is with Jean Dodds? No. Okay. Um, it's her name, and Monica Siegel. Oh, Monica, Monica Siegel. Yeah, okay. Monica Siegel has a book on it and she, you can get the book and follow it yourself and do it yourself. Or she can, you know, if your dog doesn't like this food and that food, she can try to uh, put together a diet. And I'm not sure if she's still practicing. Uh, I know she wasn't practicing as large as she was, you know, 15 years ago. But there may be other people that could put together a diet that is uh, reducing the minerals that would be causing the precipitation of the stones. Yeah. Good idea. I like that suggestion. Go talk, you know, reach out to Dr. Siegel. Uh, does anyone, before we go, Diana, Jess, Sweeta, I see that you're on Zoom. Do either and either of you three want to come on and, and ask a question, uh, audio or or audio and video? Feel free to. Um, maybe put, I'm going to unmute you guys. Uh, feel um, free. Hey, Peter. Hey, Dr. Roman. This is Shweta. Hi. Hi. So I had a question. Um, I take uh, my dog's for chiropractic adjustment every six weeks and uh, acupuncture, uh, not acupuncture, acupra ac acupressure. Um, mm -hmm. And um, how often do you recommend the B12 shots? My veterinarian only gives it to them like maybe once every 12 weeks, sometimes mm -hmm. not even then. Well, it depends. I mean, you know, if your dog has severe arthritis or has demyelinization or you know, I, I, what I tell people to do, and, and I'm, I'm usually not too pushy, like to keep doing it every week, but when I was getting trained in acupuncture, their feeling was you do it every week until, um, you know, you, you get people to sign up for like six or seven, 10 treatments and you do it every week and you see how far you go. The way I do it is I tell them, let's do it every week. If it's something that we're trying to correct and then see if we plateau. And when we plateau, then you stop for a while and then you see when it starts to drop and then you do it again. So it may be, you know, uh, that it needs to be done once a month, you know, and again, it's, it's, you know, it, it's the owner's observations that um, I find, you know, really, they say, you know, the dog just can't get up that front step anymore. I think it's time to get the ozone and the uh, aquapuncture done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Weta. Um, all right. Well, I think that we're about the hour mark. So Dr. Roman, is there anything you want to touch on before we? No, um, yeah, just all of us keep Ukraine in our prayers, you know, and just try to, you know, I don't know what's happening. They have several organizations that are helping uh, animals and stuff there. Yeah. But, you know, and I desperately need another veterinarian. So if any, I would take a Ukrainian veterinarian. <laughs> I'll take anyone that wants to do integrative materials. And so. Um, so if anybody knows anyone who wants to come to Boston, I'm, I'm really, you know, wanting an associate. So please yeah. come to Boston. 
Yeah, we definitely need one. Um, can't wait for that. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Appreciate your time as always. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you. And You're thanks welcome. everybody for coming on and watching and, and participating. All okay. right, Dr. Roman, until next time. Okay, okay. take care.